all, my name is Dr. Farida Jalalzai, and I'm really looking forward to speaking to you today. I wanted to just um, quickly share my screen. Um, I'm gonna go through my lecture and then I will do the answers to the questions that you've asked. This is um, just like a regular, it's <laughs> just like a regular presentation where things go wrong a little bit. So I'm Dr. Farida Jalalzai and I'm a professor of political science um, and associate dean of global initiatives and engagement at Virginia Tech University. Um, and today what I'm gonna be talking to you about is gender and development. So it's very clear that gender plays a vital role in development and in a number of different ways. It shapes um, different opportunities that differentiate between men and women and also shape access to resources. And so we know that women, for example, are more likely to live in poverty than their male counterparts. We also know that women are much more likely to be undervalued when it comes to their employment in the home or perhaps not being um, rewarded economically on par with their male counterparts when we're thinking about things like their earnings. And there's even those who are outside, um, employed outside of the home, we know that there tends to be employment segregation where women are clustered in fields that are um, less rewarded um, and, and viewed as less prestigious. And we know also that women still tend to shoulder the brunt of domestic work. And so if they are employed outside of the home, it doesn't mean that they're not engaged in domestic labor. It just, it tends to, the findings tend to suggest that women are, are basically trying to do it all. So that's a basic overview. Um, and if you look at the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals, one of their goals, goal five, is the goal of achieving gender equality so as to empower all women and girls worldwide. And part of that, you know, would include things like um, being recognized for their unpaid work, having an ability to gain full access to productive resources, also being able to achieve equal participation with men in different spheres, such as the political, economic, and, and public life at all, as, you know, as a whole. Um, in a lot of places around the world, women are married at young ages and may not necessarily have a choice in who it is that their spouse is. That will, of course, affect whether they're able to get a quality education. And so women typically are going to have um, higher illiteracy rates and are going to lag behind men in achieving professional degrees in certain countries. Um, and when we're thinking about certain cultural practices, if cultural pr practices are such that they frown upon women being engaged in the public sphere, or getting an education, or maybe it's fine for women to get an education, but only in a few different realms, um, then, then we know that women are achieving or aren't able to achieve their full capacity. Um, and, we, and as I already alluded to before, women are far more likely to be engaged in domestic labor compared to men. So if you have um, so much domestic responsibility, that's definitely going to shape what you're able to do in outside employment. Um, and my specialty is women in political positions. And so the, the area that I research more than any other is women prime ministers and presidents. And we know just overall that women are going to be less likely to hold political office. And that's definitely, go definitely going to shape what's done policy-wise on behalf of women. So if you look at women in parliament in 2016, we're looking at 23%. And that, that percentage doesn't really change much. So one of the, the works that I've published with my co-authors, Amy Alexander and Katie Balzendahl, um, defines political empowerment in relation to women and really tries to strategize different ways 
that we can define and measure women's political empowerment around the world. And so our definition of political, women's political empowerment is there on the slideshow. It's um, the enhancement of assets, capabilities, and achievements of women to gain equality to men and in influencing and exercising political authority worldwide. And one of the things that we argue, which I think is important, is that this is not black and white. It's not a zero sum game, meaning that if we pay attention to the needs of women, that doesn't mean that we don't pay attention to men's needs. What it means is that actually when you address women's status, there are larger benefits to society as a whole. That when you're thinking about things like women being empowered actually increases the productivity, not just of women, but of, of the economic system as a whole. And this will present other benefits. So gender equality is seen as very important for sustainable peace. There's evidence that with more gender inequality, there's a higher risk of in, um, internal conflict in a country. So there's larger benefits to the economy, to the literacy rate. You can predict a child's literacy based on whether or not their mother was, was educated. We know that violence is something, as I mentioned earlier, that can be combated with women's empowerment. And so when we look at all of these greater goods, this is not something that only advantages women, it's something that would advantage society as a whole, including men. We also know that, you know, I, I say a lot about gender um, and I'm thinking about that not as, okay, just the ways that, not at all at, in terms of ways that people are born, but that we know when, when we have males and females that gender is still going to be viewed as a major organization um, structure that will, that will factor into social relations and also power dynamics and around the world will still be used in such a way that um, creates status inequalities and they tend to work to the disadvantage of women. But we also know that it's not just, you know, gender that's going to be an organizational principle, that gender is going to intersect with other aspects such as race and ethnicity and religion and language and other sources of inequality. So we really need to be, I think, mindful of these things when we're trying to advocate for women's empowerment at large. It's, there's just going to be lots of factors, lots of obstacles that we need to attack. Um, that's just a snapshot of women elites. So again, I study women, political players, women prime ministers, women presidents. And so I'm interested in say the fact that most of the time, you know, there's far less than 10% of all executives around the world are female. And that will affect the quality of public policy making. It affects the extent to which we're able to identify visible symbols of women's political leadership. It's going to affect things like women in other positions. So if you're a president, you'll have the opportunity to appoint cabinet ministers, for example. And so that's another um, aspect that you have on this slide is that you know, usually women are far less than, you know, 25% of cabinet ministers. Um, and women in parliament has been given, I think, a lot more attention in terms of political positions than any other. Um, and I understand that because we tend to associate legislatures more closely with, you know, democratic governance and representation. And so in a lot of countries, um, women struggle to obtain seats at the table, politically speaking. Um, and when we're thinking about those who are crafting public policies um, that focus on development, that's going to, it's going to matter who's at that table. And so a lot of the research that I engage says that when women have a voice, when women have a seat, that the, the types of policies that they're creating are, are much more likely to be beneficial to lifting up marginalized groups and to creating more healthful um, societies as a whole. So I have um, some questions that I was, I was given. Um, and I'm gonna start with 
Soha Habib from Attleboro, Massachusetts, who asks, what type of development can work across the world to benefit women? And so I think here, I mean, of course, there's, there's no one way, um, there's no one thing, but I think equal educational opportunities and trainings, access to trainings in a wide array of areas. And that could include employment training, that could include um, training for political positions, policy positions, access to economic resources is really important. We've heard a lot about access to microcredit and how you know some some believe that this has been beneficial to you know lifting women out of poverty, but also you know having more funds to that would establish access to capital for small and medium sized businesses would be helpful and you know, generally an expansion of women entrepreneurs and of course greater access to clean and renewable energy sources I think would be really helpful. Um, Lisa Bogomolov in Lynn, Massachusetts asks, how does furthering the success of women in other industries relate to women in development? So here's the thing. I think engaging women in a variety of industries is important. It, it provides diversity in employment opportunities that can provide more inroads into sectors that have been dominated by men and can work to increase women's wages. Ideally, this can help lift entire families out of poverty and work to benefit societies as a whole. And then the last question I'm able to answer today is from Bohumila Kladjblova from Prague in the Czech Republic asks, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright argued that when women voice, women's voices are heard and choices heeded, societies are better able to break the chains of poverty do you think that women's representation in national legislatures affects the state's foreign policy and specifically its emphasis on development assistance? There has been work done on this very topic and it's a great question. And global investigations as to whether women's greater presence in political life, and in this case, women in the parliament, do and, po and actually the cabinet, do suggest that there's a positive association with um, a donor state's generosity being higher when you have more women in positions that um, are integrated in, in parliament and in the cabinet as a whole. So you have, a, I think, a, a very specific example of women's inclusion having benefits. And then more generally, we do see that um, women in parliament are more likely even controlling for partisanship and they're more likely to support funding for a whole host of set social spending measures, including health and education and the environment. Um, so thank you so much. My name is Dr. Farida Jalalzai. It was a pleasure to um, speak to you today. And I look forward to perhaps hearing from you sometime. I did include my email address on, our, on the first PowerPoint. So take care and good luck.